Um, and I appreciate the chance to share some of our, our most recent work. Um, I'm, I'm heavily into research these days on uh, the scenarios of the IPCC and think it's a pretty important topic. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into it. Oh, and there's Boulder. Um, you can see uh, it looks a little bit like that today, a little bit more fall colors, a little bit more wind. All right, before I start, um, let me just make this point clear um, as I won't be talking about this. It's my view that climate change is real serious and deserving of serious attention to both mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, and if you wanna know more about those views, uh, you can look at my book, The Climate Fix. Um, I'm working on a, a sequel, which may or may not uh, get sold, but um, you can find my views there. All right, so, so one of the things that's not well understood in climate um, these days is that there's really good news from the standpoint of climate policy. Um, this is from the UN Emissions Gap Report, which was put out yesterday. And I just wanna to point to, uh, this is uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and they have what was expected in 2010, uh, this way up here above 60 gigatons. And under current policies, it's, it's almost 10 gigatons less. So in terms of expectations, um, if you had a time machine and went back to 2010 and said, well, you know, here's how it looks in 2021, um, anyone concerned about climate change would have good reason for optimism because uh, it, this is not the only data, but there is plenty of data that suggests that the most extreme scenarios, uh, and I'll talk more about this, um, that we believed collectively in the scientific community five, 10, 20 years ago um, are simply off the table. Um, but that's not the story that you get um, from the media, uh, from many scientists, um, certainly from politicians. And what I'd like to do today is spend a little bit of time just diving into the massive many thousand pages of the IPCC report in areas where I have expertise um, and, and just give a, a clear eyed presentation of what the report conveys. And it's a mixed message. I'll just say that up front. The IPCC does some things very well and it does some things uh, not so well. And uh, we should be able to, to tell the difference and help that organization improve. So the first part, I'm gonna talk about extreme events. And let me say throughout, I have much more material in this slide deck than I'll be able to go through or to justify. Um, I put that in there on purpose. I'm happy to share a copy of this deck for people to go over. Um, and I will make claims today that um, I won't justify, but I think I can justify. And if you wanna go deeper, we can do that in the, in the Q and A. So here's the summary, here's the bottom line for what the uh, IPCC says on extreme. And, and I, I use the language of detection and attribution um, exactly as done by the IPCC. And if you take a look at these different categories of extremes, the IPCC makes judgments on whether trends have been detected and if there are trends, whether they have been attributed uh, to human causes, whether greenhouse gases or otherwise. Um, and, and let me say that the, the top line story is, again, very different than what we would get if you listen to the media or um, many scientists. The strongest evidence for detection of trends, and when I say detection of trends, this is over the longest period of record for which there's data, um, as I think everyone knows on this. Uh, in this audience, um, if you start and stop your, your, your data set at different points in time due to uh, climate variability, you can always find up or down trends. Uh, but this refers to the ability to detect trends uh, beyond uh, that of natural variability. And the strongest evidence is for heat waves and uh, what is called heavy precipitation, uh, both of which to some degree have been attributed uh, to human causes with heat waves having the most strongest attribution. Um, not for flooding, not for meteorological or hydrological drought, uh, not for soil moisture drought, which these two categories are, not for tropical cyclones, winter storms, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hail, lightning, extreme winds, which are straight line winds, um, and fire weather um, has been detected and attributed. And what I'd like to do is I'm gonna go through, um, I won't go through all of them in detail, obviously don't have time for that, uh, but I'll go through a, a few of them to give you a sense of what the IPCC reports uh, and then have a, a, a summary at the end. Um, I put this here, you don't have to read this, um, lost in the discussion, uh, particularly the popular discussion and the policy discussion, um, often are the definitions of climate and of climate change. Um, it's important to understand that, that climate is, is a statistical property of uh, weather um, and other events measured over many decades. Um, and climate change refers to a change in those statistics. Um, climate change is not a causal agent. 
climate change does not fuel weather. Climate change does not cause weather. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it would be incorrect to say that this or that storm was made worse by climate change. And I get it. Um, often climate change is used as shorthand for greenhouse gases, uh, but it has made the, the discussion difficult because that sloppy language has slipped its way into IPCC reports in the scientific literature as well. So um, I'm a little bit of a stickler and, and I insist that, you know, particularly when we're talking about science, terms mean what they, they mean. Um, and so when I go through this discussion, I do mean climate and climate change as defined by the IPCC glossary, as you can see here. Um, detection, again, the IPCC defines detection as um, observing um, in a statistical sense, uh, a change in the statistics of a particular phenomena. And any particular phenomena can be measured in a multitude of ways. So tropical cyclones, you could have frequency, you could have intensity, you could have their propagation rate, uh, you could have their rainfall amounts. So it's, it's very important when we talk about extreme events to be um, exceedingly precise in what it is we are talking about. Uh, too often the, the, the phrase extreme events is used as a, as a, as a bucket, a big, a big uh, bin, um, and it, it by itself doesn't mean much. And attribution um, is, is identifying the causes for observed detected changes. So I'm gonna go through these uh, one by one. And this is about the most boring kind of PowerPoint you'll ever see. And you'll have a chance if you'd like to, to read these. Um, but this is the strongest conclusion of the IPCC for extreme events. Virtually certain there's been increases in the intensity and duration of heat waves and in the number of heat wave days at the global scale. Heavy precipitation. The frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation have likely increased at the global scale over a majority of land regions with good observational coverage. Now, heavy precipitation is, is a tricky one for communication, and sometimes that is, um, it's, it's a benefit, and sometimes it's a problem, depending on who you are. But uh, heavy precipitation is not the same thing as flooding. Um, if we were to get you know, two centimeters of rain in Boulder today, that would be a heavy precipitation day, um, given the time of year, but it wouldn't lead to, to flooding. For the first time in this report, um, the IPCC um, is explicit. It says heavier rainfall does not always lead to greater flooding and has a good explanation why. Um, this has generally been known, but heavy precipitation is often measured statistically um, and doesn't necessarily correspond to societal impacts. We did a paper about 20 years ago, uh, 18 years ago, where we looked at the relationship of scientific uh, definitions of heavy precipitation and flooding and societal impacts, and they weren't well correlated. Um, and so it's really important, if you're talking about flooding, to talk about flooding. Here we go, flooding. Confidence about peak flow trends over past decades on the global scale is low. Some regions experiencing increases and some experiencing decreases. Um, so, so the confidence about flood trends is low overall. It would be inappropriate to say that, uh, that we have observed a worldwide increase in flooding. Drought. Now, drought, the IPCC changed how it referred to drought. I, I, I include the definition of drought the IPCC uses, um, and there's, there's some text here from the working group one. Um, but for hydrological and meteorological drought, which is what most people think of when they think of drought. Um, there's limited evidence and low confidence for trends um, globally or at the regional scale, and they say with few exceptions. Um, the IPCC does assert that soil moisture drought, which they now call ecological and agricultural drought, they have medium confidence that there have been trends detected and um, attribution given. Um, medium confidence refers in the IPCC vernacular to a five in 10 chance. So 50-50. Tropical cyclones. Um, I could give a whole series of talks on tropical cyclones. Um, studied that topic for almost 30 years. Um, there's low confidence in most reported long-term multi-decadal to centennial trends in tropical cyclone frequency or intensity-based metrics. Uh, for better or worse, um, ever since Al Gore's movie poster in 2006 had a hurricane spinning the wrong way coming out of a smokestack, uh, tropical cyclones have really been at the center of um, discussion, debate, promotion, advocacy for uh, climate change. And that's really unfortunate uh, because um, there's really a lot of interesting science and a lot of wonderful scientists doing work on this topic. Um, 
but there's not uh, anything close to, to, to certainty. The latest, the latest um, I guess, misleading set of, of al uh, assertions that are made are, are to start um, data sets around 1980 and to say there's been upward trends since that time. And that's undoubtedly true for many indicators worldwide and in the Atlantic. Um, a new paper uh, by Vecchi et al. Uh, assert that in the Atlantic, the 1970s uh, up to about 1980, was the quietest period in several centuries for the Atlantic. So again, it's, it's no surprise that you'd see upward trends from 1980, um, but that's why the IPCC accurately talks about long-term being multi-decadal to centennial, um, which is a, a very responsible statement. It doesn't always get translated. Winter storms, I'll just zip through these. Um, low confidence for winter storms. Thunderstorms, tornado, hail, and lightning. Um, it is not straightforward to make a synthesizing view of observed trends. Um, again, I've done research on, on these topics and I think that's particularly a fair um, conclusion. In the United States, which has a high proportion of global tornado observations, um, there is evidence that at least in the last few decades, um, tornado occurrence has decreased overall. Extreme winds, um, again, uh, not in the in the polar era areas, but for for most of the planet, um, it's becoming less severe. So a lessening of extreme winds. Fire weather. Um, so fire weather is weather conditions that promote wildfires. Um, more probable in southern Europe, northern Eurasia, the U.S., Australia over the last century. Again, medium confidence, so a 50-50 chance. So let me just point, um, when you're a subject matter expert and you read the IPCC, um, not having been involved in its creation, um, you see things that probably the lay reader wouldn't see in your area of expertise. So I just want to point to one example that, that indicates that, that some are still playing some games in the IPCC. Um, so here's an, an assertion in chapter 11, there's an increasing trend in normalized US hurricane damage. So I was very happy to see this, of course, because uh, with Chris Lancy, uh, we, we came up with the original uh, methodology and terminology of normalized damages. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. I'm not gonna explain it today. Um, and they cited one paper to say there was an increasing trend. Now, right away, um, I knew there was an issue. Um, here's a, a literature review I published earlier this year on all normalized damage studies that have been published uh, since our first one. There's 54 normalization studies in the literature. 53 make no claims of attribution. The one that the IPCC cited was the one study out of 54 that made a claim of attribution. So for me, it means they either weren't aware of the broader literature or they selected one that um, had a particular message. Now, if you look specifically at the literature on US hurricane damage, the study they highlighted has 25 citations. Um, it has an upward trend. It's not a good study, I won't go into that. The study they ignored is one of ours with 1,216 citations. So um, when the IPCC plays fast and loose with uh, areas of science, it's, it's readily seen by people who have expertise in that topic. Um, so in general, it's good not to do that. So in summary, um, overall, and we can pick nits and, and, and there are some issues with emphasis and some authors over, oversighted themselves and so on. But overall, this summary table I prepared is, um, I think, a very good representation of my understanding of the literature on extreme events um, that I've been following for 30 years. Um, and really, the, the, the two places where you can make strong claims of detection and attribution are heat waves and heavy precipitation. Um, there's some real questions about any of these other phenomena um, but it's, it's, it's uh, if you look at the, the media or you look at uh, policy advocacy or even what some scientists say, um, it does not square particularly well with what the IPCC says. All right, flying through this, part two scenarios. Let me say there's, there is quite a story here. It's a long, in-depth, complicated technical story um, with Justin Ritchie. Um, we just published a paper um, in energy research and social science. That's a 21,000 word deep dive into the scenarios that only begins to scratch the surface. If you want a copy of that, just email me. Um, I'll just go over some of the, the issues and as associated with the IPCC. So let me say scenarios are fundamental to climate research and policy. Um, this is the IPCC 
representation of all the roles that, that scenarios play and everything from uh, climate modeling to impacts modeling, to economic modeling, to policy modeling, and so on. Um, this dates to the first assessment report in 1990. Um, at that time, the IPCC chose what was called a business as usual trajectory, this is CO2 concentrations, and then offered three what are called policy scenarios um, that suggested mitigation alternatives. Um, this is a very common way to employ scenarios. It's not unique to climate. Uh, but by 2000, the IPCC did an about face and changed completely how it was approaching scenarios. Um, it, it adopted a, an approach much more consistent with the traditional shell scenarios methodology, um, if you're familiar with that, where they didn't select um, a business as usual trajectory. Um, they said all trajectories were, were just as likely. And so here's the, the family of trajectories. Um, they were all plausible futures. They were all business as usual, so to speak, futures. Um, depending on what choices we made. Um, there was a big debate in the IPCC, um, and the, the, at that time they concluded there was no objective basis on which to assign likelihood to any of the scenarios. So they were all equally likely. Um, that was politically problematic because, um, particularly for those who wanted aggressive action on climate change, if you told them that the, the, these green scenarios down at the bottom were just as likely as the red ones up top, um, someone could, with valid judgment, say, well, let's roll the dice. Maybe we'll get there without doing anything, since it's all business as usual. Um, and so that approach did not survive particularly long. Um, and again, I won't go into the details. There's a long story here. But after the SRES scenarios of equal likelihood, very quickly, um, the climate community, um, again, led by the IPCC um, and its leaders, wanted a new approach to scenarios. And these were called the representative concentration pathways, RCPs. Um, and if you pay attention to climate research, I'm sure you've heard of these. Um, these have been the dominant scenarios used in the climate literature really for uh, about 15 years now. Um, they have been uh, replaced, so to speak, by the so-called SSPs, but um, still the RCPs are dominating the literature. Um, I won't go through the details here, but the, one of the key things to understand about the RCPs is that climate modelers wanted uh, pathways of radiative forcing in order to drive climate models. Um, traditionally, we got to those pathways of radiative forcing by first having emission scenarios, which come from integrated assessment models, which employ assumptions of economic growth, global population, energy consumption, energy production, land use, and so on. Um, it takes a long time for integrated assessment modelers to come up with a comprehensive model um, scenario of the long-term future. And so what the climate modeling community says is, you know, hey, can, can we just start with radiative forcing pathways and we'll give those to the climate modelers. And then at the same time, we'll give those to the integrated assessment modelers and they can figure out how to get there. That way we can start running our climate models right away. We don't have to wait a couple of years for these integrated assessment modelers to get their act together. This was a fateful decision. This is what led, uh, I would argue, much of current climate research that depends on scenarios um, down the wrong track. So, so in the AR5 for the IPCC, if you go to their working group three database, there's 1,184 scenarios that were submitted. So all these little spaghetti lines here in this graph are different scenarios in the database. Um, in order to facilitate climate modeling research, um, I thought you can't obviously use 1,184 scenarios in climate models. So they said, well, let's, let's just get some representative scenarios. Um, let's just pick a, a limited number. So they picked four. They renamed them to so a low one, high one, they picked two in the middle, so people didn't think it was the most likely outcome. And they said, all right, we're going to use these four for climate modeling. They, they best meet the needs of climate modeling. What was forgotten or, or not observed at the time, uh, these, these four scenarios came from this large family of integrated assessment models. So instead of splitting climate modeling off from socioeconomic assumptions, um, these scenarios already had socioeconomic assumptions baked into them because you had to, had to have those assumptions in order to produce the radiative forcing. 
um, and then another fateful decision. So the four RCPs come from four different integrated assessment models, AIM, GCAM, image, message. Um, th these are like an apple, an orange, a banana, and a pear. They're not directly comparable to one another. They are different models. But when they were renamed as RCPs, the impression was given that they are of a common set that only differ in their radiative forcing. Huge, huge uh, mistake there in the, in the renaming. Um, so here's the, the models they actually come from. So there are thousands of climate scenarios out there. But right now, only 8 to 12 are presently available for climate research. So this winnowing process that went from thousands of scenarios to a handful, I, every time I, I say this, I am stunned. No one has responsibility for determining, are these scenarios plausible? Do they reflect plausible futures um, that we might hit? Um, if you're doing climate research and climate modeling research, there's plenty of reasons to use uh, implausible or extreme scenarios in, in modeling. Um, it can, you can explore how your model works, you can, you can generate hypotheses, um, but that shouldn't be confused with projecting plausible futures for purposes of impacts analysis, economic analysis, or policy analysis. Um, the, the climate community decided which scenarios to prioritize, so that's the blue tier one, um, and two of the most extreme are the top priorities. And as I'll argue here in a second, these are uh, the most implausible scenarios. So IPCC is getting the message. Um, some of us have been harping on this a lot. Um, and so it, it has very mixed messages on scenarios in the current report. So in first it says no likelihood is attached to the scenarios assessed in this report. So that's very much like the SRES scenario. But then if you read a little bit further, it says the likelihood of high emission scenarios such as RCP 8.5 or SSP 585, these are the most extreme, is considered low in light of recent developments in the energy sector. Where the world actually is, the IPCC is approximately in line with the medium RCP 4.5, 6.0, and SSP 2 4.5 scenarios. This is an, an incredible admission by the IPCC. Um, this, this should have been one of the top line messages from this report. Now, if you go back in time um, to the AR5, um, RCP 8.5, so baseline means where we think we're headed, often called business as usual. The baseline range was the extreme. So these were the most likely in the absence of climate policy. So that change between AR5 and AR6 is uh, I cannot overstate it, it's just massive. So if you look at the current report, and if you look at, well, where do, where do they focus their attention? Um, and if you look at the scenarios and how they're referenced, um, more than half are the 7.0 and 8.5 studies. So over half of the research summarized in the discussion of the AR5 is on implausible scenarios. I haven't shown you why they're implausible yet, I'm just asserting that, I will in a second. Um, but the most extreme scenarios dominate the literature and also the uh, IPCC reports. Here's that same data for um, the, the AR5. You can look at this at your leisure. One thing I would note, the AR6 relies more on extreme scenarios than did the AR5. Uh, and the US National Climate Assessment, even more so. So these extreme scenarios, which are again, plenty of legitimate reasons to use them in climate research, uh, they dominate the IPCC reports. Um, one reason for this, and I mean, this is good news for the IPCC, they are accurately reflecting the literature. Um, so this is uh, Google Scholar mentions, this is from uh, about two years ago, um, of different papers, how often they re refer to the RCPs. And again, RCP 8.5 is the most dominant scenario in the literature. Um, to some degree, this was intended. When the IPCC created the RCPs, they said, well, if we have a common basis of scenarios in the literature, that will make it much easier when it comes time to write the assessment reports because everyone will be using the same scenario. That's true. But if you introduce a bias into the literature, it means that the entire literature will also be biased. So 
needless to say, and this is, I could, I could create a new slide like this every week. Um, if you read a media report about climate impacts, you know, I will give good odds that it's going to be based on RCP 8.5. Um, I just had a little fun with uh, KNMI in, in, in the Netherlands this week on their new report that comes out uh, on sea level rise that discussed uh, RCP 8.5 and also a more extreme version of that, which got a lot of media attention. Um, it's endemic. It's, it's throughout the literature. So the bottom line is that there's massive confusion. Um, these scenarios, and again, this is the, uh, Detlef Van Buren is one of the, 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 the big wigs, the creators of scenarios. He admitted in 2008, the primary goal of the RCP exercise is to provide input data for climate models. It was not to provide usable information for policymakers or uh, knowledge for impact analysis. Um, RCPs are mainly intended to facilitate the development of integrated scenarios by jumpstarting the climate modeling process. So we, we had a conflation here, what was good for climate modeling versus what might be needed by broader society. Um, the IPCC warned, um, this is from Richard Moss in 2014, is RCP 8.5 the reference for the other RCPs? And he, this is his slide, no, don't use it like that. Um, here's 5,800 um, papers that use it like that um, from last March. Um, the, the misuse of these scenarios is, is fundamental. As I mentioned, the RCPs aren't RCPs. They're, 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 they're models that can't be compared. If you wanna compare an RCP 8.5 to a mitigation scenario, you do it within the message model. Um, but the other message scenarios aren't included. So what happens is people compare this RCP to say RCP 2.6. So for example, the IPCC Oceans Report does that throughout. Um, you can't compare message to image. There's, there's billions more people in one world than another world hundreds of trillions more GDP in one world versus another. They're not comparable worlds. They're two fictional worlds. Um, I, I won't go into any detail. The SSPs, um, which are the, the, the updated version of the RCPs are repeating the same mistakes, selecting four marker scenarios um, for, for use in comparisons. Um, based on some of our research, the most plausible of all of these scenarios in the SSPs is a scenario called SSP 2 3.4. That's right here. Uh, that scenario is not even being studied. So if, if you want to ask the IPCC, what's the most plausible future for humanity under current climate models, that question cannot be answered because that scenario is not included in the study set. All right, so what's wrong with this? Um, these scenarios are fine for exploratory modeling, but they're implausible. Um, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at our papers on this. I won't go into any more detail, but just to give you a sense of why they're implausible. So here's CO2 emissions. Um, this is pre-pandemic um, when our, our, one of our first papers came out. This is how the IEA foresaw emissions going forward to 2040. Um, as you might guess in 2021, they're significantly lower partly due to, the, due to the pandemic. Here's SSP 5, 8.5, up, 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 7.0, and so on. Um, the, the, the real world is outside of the spread of the 1,184 models that you find in the AR5. One reason for this is that the IPCC scenarios all assume massive growth in, in coal energy worldwide, and reality is going the other direction. Um, the, the RCP 8.5 foresees the building of 33,000 new coal-fired power plants by 2100. Right now, there's 6,600 in the world. So I'm, I'm not a big on long-term predictions, but I'm really comfortable saying the world is not going to build 33,000 more coal-fired power plants in the next uh, 75 years. Very confident. So we have done a study, and, and I'm happy to share it with you. That's under review right now. Um, got good reviews, so I think it's going to be published. Evaluating what are plausible AR5 and SSP scenarios. We did this by asking what scenarios are most consistent with recent history and with the projections of the IEA to 2040. And the blue dots are the most accurate scenarios to date and the most in line with the IEA. And they converge around SSP 3.4 as I mentioned, going forward. 
very far away from the 8.5 and 7.0. I mean, these are these are off in fantasy land, um, I would say. So just some closing observations on scenarios. Um, climate science has a huge problem. Um, just this week, uh, there, I was part of an exchange in, in the National Academy of Sciences um, journal Issues in Science and Technology. And uh, the president of the US National Academy of Sciences and uh, the former co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2 both said it's 100% accurate that, the, that RCP 8.5 is currently business as usual. Um, the, the scenario lead author for the US National Assessment um, just last week said um, the world is currently on track for RCP 8.5. And you know, I publish a paper like this, and it's like, well, you know, <laughs> not really. So, um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so I'm going to end there. I'm happy to have a conversation. Uh, special thanks to my colleagues Matt Burgess and Justin Ritchie, who are fantastic um, colleagues on the scenarios work. Um, they 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 get no responsibility for anything I say, um, but I've learned a lot from both of them. Um, and also on extremes, um, you can find my work. I've done a lot of work on extremes and happy to have a discussion with that. Um, and with that, I will end and I look forward to, to chatting with you.